So, a few weeks ago I played the original Resident Evil 4 in preparation for the remake. I've already said my piece on it in my previous video and I encourage you to check it out, but to sum it up I really enjoyed the game. I had some minor nuisances with the controls, but in general I had a good time with it and even though I can't feel the impact it had for shooters moving forward, I could still feel the blueprint it established for years to come, not just for action, but for an entire genre. And now 18 years later, we've arrived at the remake, which has been a recent trend set by Capcom since the remake of RE2 in this somewhat newly reimagined timeline they're going towards. RE4 has always been that one game that didn't need a remake, according to the general masses. Many saw it as perfect, and the remake had the potential of fumbling the spirit of the original, as it is not an easy thing to present something existing with a fresh coat of paint, and RE3 is a clear example of that, although I really quite love the game but many OG fans don't for understandable reasons. Me having played the game, I could see the sentiment, but I'm always open to new things and see how they pan out. Now with the remake out, it's safe to say that expectations have been met, if not exceeded, and from the get-go, it was pretty obvious the game wouldn't revolutionize the same way the original did, and it didn't need to in my opinion. But what Capcom achieved is something I deeply admire. Full stop, Resident Evil 4 Remake is a complementary masterpiece to the original, as it not only remains faithful to the source material, but it shakes things up mechanically and thematically to give us one of the best remakes ever made, and I really want to go in depth about it. One of the best things to have happened to Capcom in recent years is the Reach for the Moon, or RE Engine for short, which debuted with the release of RE7. This engine aims to target high fidelity visuals with a smooth target frame rate of 60 frames per second, and all games making use of this engine never disappoint, 4 Remake included. The game is visually striking in its presentation and seamless atmosphere as we traverse through the various locales within the village, castle and island, and dense in its environmental detail and sheer attention to detail in the majors, like gore and hair physics, to the most minute like trigger discipline when holding a weapon and Leon shifting to a center axis relock stance, a close distance technique for firearm retention, which is such an absurd but equally nutty thing to include and I love the game the more for it. Equal to some of the changes made to the general environments and overall mood that accompanies the darker tone of the narrative, are the character redesigns which are superb. From the main cast, with Leon for example now looking very shook and traumatized by the events of RE2, Ashley now looking more like a young adult sporting a new jacket on top of her sleeveless vest and a new hairstyle, Louise looking more flamboyant than ever before with a new face model, Ada with her more practical red sweater dress, and some really out of this world designs by the sheer uniqueness of the absolute tiny details within them, with the red zealot with the staff from the Los Illuminados being my favorite. Performance wise, the game is also buttery smooth, never once in my 17 hour playthrough experiencing crashes, bugs or hiccups, as I was playing on PS5 in performance mode. Among the general visual options present in the menu, there's this one called hair strands which improves hair and fur quality and I kid you not, seeing it in motion further enhances the presentation as you'll often see the hair bounce, swing and fling realistically, especially in cutscenes, giving it a very CG filmic look. The only drawback to this sheer amount of detail is how it often fails to provide readability when it comes to exploration, specifically when looking for resources since the more realistic props blend well with the environments. This is mostly apparent in the laboratory on the island where I was struggling to find ammo as I had to regularly open the map to see the symbols present, but other than that moment the game does a very good job in communicating which prop can be broken for resources. In my previous video, I mentioned how the original RE4 was designed under the Action Survival Horror moniker, where a large emphasis was placed on balancing both the action elements and survival elements within its many gameplay systems like combat and resource management. I somewhat fear that this remake could have fallen into the RE6 camp of game design where snappy and over the top action is 100% its priority, but thankfully it doesn't, but what they did here instead is taking what was already successful with the remakes of 2 and 3 and recontextualizing them under this new action framework, and it's incredible the lengths they went to both completely redesign its entire structure from level design, combat, narrative and mechanics 
while still remaining faithful to the source material and in many ways strengthening the rewritten story to greater heights. For starters, level design this time around leans towards a hub-based approach compared to the linearity of the original. This change allows exploration to expand, not just in the side quests that require the completion of some challenges like shooting medallions and the treasure system being more thorough and explaining to new players how it works and dynamic, but backtracking as well, which presents more interconnectivity within areas. Most of the locations of the original remain, but they've been retooled to fit with the new changes like the valley, being more visually adjacent to the original while reworking the general layout, and the lake, that includes small islets that we can explore for said side quests, story progression, or general exploration, just to name a few. Movement no longer adheres to the tank controls of the original, and instead it now adopts the omnidirectional movement present in modern video games. This particular change presents a challenge in combat design, as we no longer get locked into place and carefully aim our shots as enemies slowly walk towards us. So to counter this, enemy aggressiveness has been ramped up to 11, not just in damage output, but how proactive they are at hunting now. We'll get grabbed, beaten and thrown stuff more often than in the original, and this ends up bringing to the general combat a heightened layer of strategizing not very present in the original one where quick thinking plays a crucial part where it can determine our victory or defeat when overwhelmed. The moment-to-moment -moment game feel has also obviously been radically changed to be more in line with the newer remakes while remaining its own thing. Movement feels heavier and tight while also allowing some agility to be had during combat encounters and in the general movement while traversing. The gunplay is also much tighter and snappier, not 100% laser sharp as the original, but with enough weapon bloom to allow some bullet spread. Contextual prompts for environmental props are still present, like vaulting or climbing stairs, but opening doors is much more seamless. In fact, there is a low reliance on fitting into gaps and such, as different types of doors and their animations signal pretty clearly when we're entering a new area. The combat system sees two new additions to the existing framework of the original that have big influences on the general loop. The first one is parrying, and just as the name suggests, it's all about timing an enemy's attack to defend yourself. The genius here is how it feels complementary to the already solid combat structure. Parries can build stagger just like shooting at specific enemy parts like the leg or head, and you're also given the same context-sensitive prompts like kicks and suplexes. Quicker stabs are also a new welcome addition compared to previous games, which speeds up the process of dispatching some enemies or just saving ammo. Thankfully, you can't rely on this tactic forever as the knife has your ability, and once it breaks, you're completely forced to be more careful, which is a perfect way of approaching this problem. A knife with infinite durability can be acquired as an extra unlockable, by the way, which it takes some extra steps to get to, but the option is still there. The second one is the crouch mechanic, which allows us to duck under objects and avoid incoming attacks, while also being able to dispatch enemies silently and in some cases clear entire sections when you really know what you're doing, thus introducing some stealth elements as well. What I love about this new stealth layer is that it introduces opportunities of planning where you can just remain still, observe and prepare the perfect route of circumstances, whether quietly or mixing rowdy actions like setting traps with mines or making use of environmental props like the barrels or the bear traps to get the upper hand, which is necessary when taking into account the enemy variety who happen to play a big part for such diverse toolsets to be present. Some enemies have received visual redesigns as expected, but most importantly, their behavior has also changed, for example, the chainsaw wielding enemies who could one-shot you in the original cannot be parried thanks to the new mechanic, but they remove a large amount of durability from your knife, forcing you to carefully call your shots. The Garador, who you can now make use of crouch to quickly stab them in the back. The Armadura, that can now be momentarily paused with a blue lantern, which is more beneficial during Ashley's section. And the Novistador, who used to camouflage by turning invisible in the original, but now camouflage to fit with the environment's appearance, which is much easier and equally frightening to deal with them. Even though it remains true to the original, the remake only introduces one new enemy type, which are the Brutes, 
enemies that usually hold a sledgehammer or a wrist bow and they can soak up a ton of damage, similar to the Gatling men in the original. The companion AI is much more improved for both Ashley and Louise, especially Ashley, which is one of the game's strongest accomplishments. In the original, you can ask Ashley to either follow you, sit still, or hide in a particular place. In the remake, this has been reworked, so as you can still ask Ashley to stick close to you like glue, but when you ask her to stand back, she'll no longer stand still, but both give you enough space and avoid incoming enemy attacks, and when she gets injured, she goes into an incapacitated state instead of having her own health bar, meaning you no longer share healing items, which is a very welcoming addition. Not just that, but she's more proactive both mechanically and narratively. Ashley will often give hints to Leon, she's more chatty and conversations feel more natural as a result. You know, I... I was thinking... We work well together, don't we? I guess so. Right? Maybe someday I'll become an agent like you. What do you think? We could protect the US from any and all threats. Is that right? Well, either way, first we have to make it out of here. <laughs> You're no fun. The major stroke of genius with this combat loop is how engaging it is and how you're forced to use every tool at your disposal and more particular, I love how the remake still abides to the action philosophy established with the original but it's still action in a very particular Resident Evil way. This could have easily fallen into the RE6 trap of becoming very fast paced and twitchy but here, the general balance keeps everything in check. There'll be times when you're low on ammo, healing items, throwables, and even when it feels you're about to die, the game's smartly tuned RNG systems, paired with how often our quick thinking skills are required, it gives enough brevity to play our cards right and always make it out alive, and I can't even imagine how long and precise the playtesting sessions must have been to get to this point. Overall, it's just so cool seeing the game encompassing and encouraging different gameplay styles and rewarding you accordingly, whether it is through personal satisfaction to in-game rewards. Matter of fact, this remake seems to be the only game in the series of remakes so far where combat is purely skill-based, and the best moments you'll have is when you're fighting to hell and back. Another thing I would like to point out is how the game design is very much the way I like to put it, arcade cinema. I'm still working on a catchy name, but what I'm implying is that the game pursues a very filmic presentation in its visual and game mechanics while also adhering to arcade-like design philosophies where gameplay is king. In most AAA cinematic games, there's a reliance on the common storytelling structures present in films while also using its mechanics to help sell the idea and feel. This thing by itself is not a bad choice, at the end of the day being just a choice. But what often ends up happening from my point of view is that those mechanics often suffer because they're not taking enough advantage of either the fear of breaking immersion or oversight. A good comparison I would like to give are the Horizon games and The Last of Us Part 2. The combat in the Horizon games is what I like to call Arcade Monster Hunter. It's the type of game that gives you the tools, you have a large variety of enemies that allow you to make use of your entire toolset both humans and machines, and there are so many variables at play systemically that it won't force you but encourage you to use different tools to dispatch your foes. Big emphasis on won't force but encourage. In Last of Us 2, although it shares elements with RE4 in terms of survival horror game design, it still falls into the trap of not relying on its game mechanics enough to push you to try different tactics unless you're pursuing them yourself and see how far you can push it. This isn't to say that, it, that it's poorly designed or anything, as you can see people playing that game like John Wick, and I quite enjoyed myself, but the game just doesn't demand much of you like RE4 does. To make it clearer, let me use the push and pull frameworks and game design theory as an example, but only push. Games with a push framework in the simplest words is, player pushes the system, system pushes the player. When you enter a room and the system sends a group of enemies to attack you, the system expects you to push back against it, and you make use of the tools at your disposal to meet the objective. Depending on the balancing, it can either result in players finding a meta and relying on that meta for the majority of the playthrough, or use every tool available. In the case of RE4 and Clue, enemy variety plays a big part in that balancing. 
Enemy variety in RE4 is vast from humanoid and non-humanoids, and most of them force you to play differently, like shooting specific body parts of the villagers and the Los Ominados to make them drop their weapons, shooting or stabbing Garados in the back, shooting armaduras in specific spots where the plague is exposed, freezing Verdugo to deal triple damage, and the general context-sensitive moves that encourage you to get up and close and personal. Tlu, compared to RE4, has a more limited number of enemy variety, consisting of humans who attack back by firing at you, which makes CQC more intense but with fewer opportunities of expression for the general player, and the infected who are generally fast and dash at you, leaving little room to carefully consider your options as the intensity comes more from the ferocity they exude. I have to reiterate that I'm not bashing Tlu, I'm just using it as an example to showcase how different games in the same genre can be designed. Two AAA cinematic games that actually fit perfectly into the arcade cinema philosophy are both Metal Gear Solid V and Death Stranding. It's well known that Kojima really loves movies, and he regularly implements many techniques of that medium into video games. What he sometimes doesn't get enough credit for is how he understands perfectly that his projects are video games, and the fact that games have visual, auditorial and interactive elements, he takes full advantage of the medium to produce the perfect synergy between cinematic storytelling and interactivity where gameplay is king. Both MGS and DS are story-driven, very cinematic in their presentation, and the open-ended approach to game design they feature allows for very systemic mechanics to be present, where a combination of tools help you reach your goals in a way the game never tells you if it's the right or wrong way of doing it, and everything is up to you. The original RE4 approached its narrative with a campy tone, not a bad thing as it resulted in a rollercoaster experience, but this time the remake goes for a darker and mature tone, and it absolutely succeeded. Some of the humor remains, but it's much more toned down and used appropriately, when the scene warrants it, and most of all, a big part of it being so well told is the rewritten story to accommodate both the original ideas, expanding some elements, and still retaining the immaculate pacing of the original, as well as the strong performances that sell each character's motivation very well. Even the merchant and his witty lines deserve some praise. Wish your enemies sweet dreams from afar, with a bullet straight through their heads! <laughs> Leon and Ashley are much more grounded and more aware of the situation they're in, with Leon still scarred by the events of Raccoon City but still pushing forward to get Ashley to safety, and Ashley herself, who starts off very scared and insecure, but as the game goes she becomes more confident and brave, allowing her to be more proactive. Luis this time has much more screen time compared to the original, and his character development is one of the best realized potentials. Then come, Sancho Panta! Let us rescue the Princess Dulcinea! You're gonna hurt yourself. Hey, that was my dance. Okay, we hurry, I get it. Ada also gets much more improved scenes compared to the original, where her motivations develop more naturally as the story goes. There has been some criticism about her VA, and at first I was trying to adjust to her performance, as the jump from RE2 to now is pretty jarring, but by the end I was completely on board with the tone she brings to her. Oh, Leon. You know I don't work in town. Now, my personal highlight are the villains, and man, compared to the original, they are much more fleshed out, convincing, menacing, and most of all intriguing, especially Krauser, who has to be the one character where the most love was poured into, eventually becoming one of my all-time favorite RE villains as the game kept going. He's so perfect in here, and I want to gush about it. Early in the game, it is established that Krauser is Leon's commander who suddenly disappeared during an operation. There are some references sprinkled in about his presence until you fully meet him when he kills Luis. There you'll face him with a CQC encounter completely reliant on knives, which is genius how the new parry mechanic leads to more interactivity to this boss fight compared to the quick time events of the original, and I live for that ingenuity. Also, I love how having him kill Luis instead of Sadler instills that need for the player to seek revenge 
further enhancing his character. After the encounter, he's seen two more times, when he takes Ashley to the island, which is very little screen time, and when you eventually face him for a final showdown. Linking this to my dissection of the game design, the greatest achievement of the remake is the pursuit of the arcade cinema design philosophy of wanting to be a film while gameplay is king, and this entire encounter is a culmination of this very formula, masterfully fusing both story and gameplay that even surpasses the original. In the original, the training ground is built like a maze, and Leon has to find three pieces so he can open a passage blocking the door. In the remake, this entire segment is redesigned to be completely linear, and what it offers in return is a chance of fully fleshing out both characters as they spew out their grievances to each other. The Reaper comes for cowards and the careless alike. Which are you? I don't know. This is the last one I see. Well, you've really gone all out for me. You shouldn't have. Knife combat is still present in the first phase, just like the previous encounter, and in the second phase, it's just like the original, but his moveset is much more expanded, and you'll have to make good use of your surroundings to take him out. What follows afterwards, and the way I like to interpret this scene, is this very beautiful moment not present in the original, where in his dying breath, he asks Leon to finish the job. And in doing so, Krauser both expresses regret in his actions as he no longer is under the influence of the Plaga, but also content as he realizes that Leon's entire training didn't go in vain, and in some way still living a piece of him within Leon, who he knows will fight for good, and I find that really poetic. Other small narrative changes I also love is how Salazar is much less cartoony villain, but more annoying in terms of his arrogance and manner of speech, as he perfectly gives off the energy of a spoiled brat who has to see everything done this way. This new interpretation of Sadler is also much better than the original in my opinion. In the original, I've always found really weird how he would constantly contact you and casually chat with you, but here, his presence feels much more threatening as the few moments of screen time he has is enough to sell how unhinged, creepy and scary his mannerisms are, not just his personality but his redesign as well, showcasing how the Plaga has fused with him physically through such long periods of contact. This isn't the end by the way, alongside the killer campaign there's also the mercenaries mode coming on the 7th of April. There has been some data mining confirming Ada's side story is on the way as DLC, and there's a VR mode coming as well. I also have to commend Capcom for having both the original and the remake readily available for sale. This may not seem like a big thing, but when you have companies like Rockstar delisting the original GTA PS2 trilogy in favor of a remaster that butchers the legacy for a quick buck, anything's possible. I'm also very curious to see what the future holds for the RE series in terms of remakes because so far we've had remakes for 2, 3 and now 4, and Capcom has sort of softly rebooted this timeline, and it feels like the next obvious step is remaking RE5. It's easy to say the game doesn't need a remake as it still plays well, but with the story changes present in the remake, both 5 and 6 being the next on the block isn't at all surprising, especially when it feels like it would comfortably sit well with 7 and 8. They could even remake the first Resident Evil game, RE0 and Code Veronica which would be very interesting to see how they'll approach it. Regardless, 
Resident Evil 4 Remake is without a shadow of a doubt one of the best remakes of all time. It does just enough to be its own thing to remain fresh and unique and Capcom have genuinely achieved perfection with this and I can't wait to see what this remake timeline holds for the future. If you enjoyed the video leave a like, subscribe, share with your friends and activate the bell so you can get notification of my latest video and thank you for watching.